I'm just going to take a moment to unpack a few things. And while I'm doing that, would you all please read the 37 words on the screen behind me? Now, many of you have, may have heard the phrase, speak softly and carry a big stick. Those words were first spoken in 1901 by President Theodore uh, Roosevelt, describing his philosophy on foreign policy. Today, I'm going to change that up just a bit to describe my philosophy on gender equity in sport and how it has benefited millions of women. Speak confidently and carry a lacrosse stick. <laughs> Maybe a tennis racket, a t-ball bat, or in my case, an oar. So back to those 37 words. Long run-on sentence. Maybe you notice that nowhere in that um, long sentence do you see the word sport athlete, or competition. And yet that is what Title IX is best known for. As we approach the 50th anniversary of Title IX, all women should celebrate. We are better for this law. Whether you shot the winning basket in 1982 or watched your daughter slide into home plate last fall, women have more opportunities and more success today than they had pre-Title IX. Title IX was designed to bring gender equity to educational uh, institutions. That meant going forward that women were to be given equal access not just to the classroom but also to the playing field. Lessons in leadership, teamwork, how to lose so you can win next time are all critical skills for personal and professional success. Title IX became law on June 23, 1972. It was an amendment to the Education Act and patterned after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, prohibiting discrimination based on race. As Richard Nixon's signature was drawing, I was filling out college applications. And this is what it looked like. Not very many girls played sports in high school. Not very many young women played sports in college. Less than 10% of the medical and legal degrees were awarded to women. And if you were a high school senior who had practiced really hard and trained and just won the state championship in tennis, you weren't going to be offered an athletic scholarship in 1970 because there were no athletic scholarships awarded to women at that time. So in the fall of 73, I headed to college, went to Oakland, California to attend Mills College. I'd been an athletic kid growing up, encouraged by my parents, especially my mom. I'd played a variety of sports. But I wanted to try something different in college. I wanted a team sport. And when I got there, I was very pleased to find that Mills had a women's rowing team. So I signed up and became part of a small team a club sport, and we were coached by a grandfatherly man who believed in many myths. A 1974 report on the status and education of women actually listed these myths, and these are three of my favorite. Participation in athletics might damage a woman's reproductive system. Women's bones are more fragile than male bones. And women should not play contact sports because it might damage their breasts. So we thought it was pretty hysterical that our coach wouldn't let us run more than a mile because it might damage our breasts. We didn't know that it was an actual concern pre-Title IX, and we ignored it. Now down the road a few miles at the University of California, Berkeley, and all other educational institutions in the country, they were scrambling to implement these new laws. At a lot of schools where there was a body of water close to campus, they started women's rowing programs. The teams tended to be large, and the rosters, 50 plus, could quickly offset the number of male athletes. At Cal, 
the new women's coach, fresh off the men's team, would literally stand in the middle of campus, sounds a little creepy today, but he would stand in the middle of the campus and he would watch for the tall, fit female students to walk by. And he'd walk right up to them and say, want to try rowing? Uh, many of them said yes. So by this time I'd been rowing at Mills for a couple of years and loved the sport really was enjoying it and wanted to go to a higher level of competition. We were just a club sport there. So I talked to the coach at Cal, and he actually was pretty pleased that I wanted to come to Cal. So I transferred, and that next fall, I started rowing f as a student female athlete at a Division I school. Now, not only did I get to run more than a mile? I was required to run more than a mile. We spent most afternoons in the gym lifting weights, and five or six mornings a week, we were up and on the water by seven o'clock. I was learning all kinds of skills and getting stronger and more fit, and I was loving it. So in the next 10 years, things were just booming on campuses. Athletic programs were growing at a rate that was really challenging for the schools. By the mid-80s, there were twice as many women's teams, twice as many women athletes on campus. And it was tremendously expensive. There were s several problems. Many of the men were also concerned about the fact that they would be losing some of their traditional sports to the women's sports as they leveled the playing field. Today there's actually a net gain in both men's and women's sports, but in, this, in the mid-80s it was a concern. The Office of Civil Rights wrote pages detailing the requirements, but the lawsuits soon followed and continue today. However, women had gotten a taste of athletics and competition at the highest level, and there was no going back. In 1976, the women's crew team at Yale made national news by protesting the conditions that they had to endure. This nationally ranked team shared the boathouse with their men. After practice, they would wait on the bus while the men showered and dressed for class. There was no women's locker room in the facility. In the springtime, with the ice just off the water, they would wait in their sweat-drenched sweats as it froze to their bodies. And they were just not going to take it anymore. This group of physically and mentally strong women took a bare all stance with Title IX literally ha taking their back, they read their statement that began with the words, these are the bodies that Yale is exploiting. This particular group of athletes went on to become Olympians, lawyers, doctors, professors, one started a very successful plumbing company, and another is one of the owners of a WNBA championship basketball team, the Seattle Storm. So back in California, sunny California, we weren't dealing with the extreme weather conditions, but we weren't invited to the men's boathouse, so we built our own. Construction, another lesson that my team learned from Title IX. So I graduated a few years later, and I packed my bag with all of the tools that I had learned from sport and competition. Leadership, followership, competition, dedication, you name it, it all went into my bag, and I talk, took off to go flying. In 1981, I was hired by Northwest Airlines, now part of Delta as a third woman pilot. For the next 35 years, I crisscrossed this country, often at 35,000 feet, and all over the world. But in that long career, rarely did a day go by where I didn't credit my success to the things that I had learned through sport and competition. When I graduated, I set the goal that I would be an airline pilot by the time I was 25. I worked with the drive of an athlete to achieve that goal. 
I was not phased when I wasn't hired by the first airline that I interviewed with because I knew with practice and training, I would be better the next time I tried. And building that boathouse, I learned all kinds of things, mechanical things that helped me in tests and training that all boys got in shop, but that I had never been taught in home ec. And every single time that I went to work, I practiced my flying skills with the dedication of an athlete because I knew I could always improve. So what's it look like today? It's a very different picture. Five times as many girls play sports in high school. Over 215,000 young women play sports in college. That's up from 32,000 in the 70s. And that doesn't include the ones who play intramural or team sport or uh, club sports. This directly relates to the health and well-being of women. Now, we all see it in the paper. Our doctors tell us, stay fit, stay active, you'll be healthy. But statistics have shown that girls, when they start playing sports at a young age, have a lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Women have a lower risk of breast cancer. And these strong bones are much less susceptible to the debilitating effects of osteoporosis. And for me, I can still get my bag in the overhead bin. <laughs> well, and then, of course, we have almost 50% of the legal and medical degrees now are awarded to women. A recent Ernst & Young ESPNW survey showed that 94% of the women, business women in the C-suite played sports in high school. 53% played in college. So this looks like a pretty good route, a pretty good path to success. And today, if your daughter is that state champion in tennis, she is going to be heavily recruited and most likely end up with a full ride scholarship to the college of her choice. Last year, there were 86,000 athletic scholarships available to women. That's zero to 86,000. So there's still some work to be done. If you read the sports page or watch sports on television, you know that we receive much less, women receive much less media coverage. It's actually less than 2%. And this is what inspires the kids, the next generation of girls to follow that path that might lead to an athletic scholarship and certainly to their health and well-being. Also, there's still a big discrepancy when you get to the highest leadership levels in athletics. Only about 20% of the athletic directors in all three divisions are, are women. And there are still more men coaching women's sports. So these are numbers that should change and will change. Now, nearly five decades into this, we're not quite there but the progress is impressive. When you read, when we read these 37 words of Title IX, a law that brought, demanded gender equality at educational institutions, we should all be proud and we should feel really good about Congress doing what was right. And that 19, 74 study, the one that listed all those myths, did a really good job in their conclusion, which ended with a statement, equity demands that women be given a sporting chance. Thank you.